scripture says that all authority in heaven and on earth was given to Jesus. So tell me, why do some people shy away from his name? Because the world that's playing with Satan hates him? But we don't fear that world. We're not concerned with the fleeting influence there. Why would we waver when Jesus is on our side? Let's worship today like we know that Jesus is on our side. days we all will stand in judgment for every single word that we have spoken. One of these days we all will stand before the Lord, give a reason for everything. precious Savior and a powerful Redeemer suffered and sacrificed for me and for you. And I'm going to ask a question this morning, and I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to go before it and us to reply. Do you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? Let's say amen, say yes I do, anything you want. All right, I'm going to ask it again, and I want us to worship him as we reply. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Amen. Now, this morning, I also believe, and I pray that you believe, 
that God has released the power of the Holy Spirit into your life. He'll do it now for us to live and pray and worship like you know He has your back. people worship, I know that you are rewarding their praise with your Holy Spirit and strengthening their faith, God. Thank you, Lord, that your spirit moves so real in our lives, God, that this is not some fairy tale that we talk about, but Lord, your promises are true. 
Your word has power, Lord, and you are alive in our lives, God. We praise your name and pray that you keep moving, Lord, that your momentum just grows, and Lord, that your spirit moves and that we are changed today and that we give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, children can be dismissed. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You see, I was turned to James. I knew he was going to be the loud one. I love that. Um, all right. Well, Matt uh, must have wanted to preach a little bit this morning. Um, he was already telling you about our series that we're starting today. We are starting this journey for the next six weeks where we're really going to dig into the topic of prayer. I know, I mean, we've mentioned it over... Um, the last year or so of us being here, we know that it's important. You know that it's important. It's something that has to be a foundation of our church. And we know these things. And I've said these things so many times, but we're going to kind of just zero in on prayer because it is so important if we are going to become the people that God has called us to be. We've called it, this is how we fight. Just like Matt said, this is how we really engage in the spiritual realm. This is how we go about spreading the kingdom of God and pushing back the kingdom of the enemy, how we see changes happen. It is through prayer. When you look throughout history and you say, oh man, look at this revival, look at this great thing God did. As you continue to look at them, you are going to find people praying. I have heard so many of your dreams for what this church can be, for what our ministries can do, for who they can reach, for the impact that we can have on the world around us. And it's amazing. But if we're ever going to become this church and these people, we really have to just dig into prayer like we've never done before. Most of us, and, and I can say this because I have spent a lot of time there, most of us, when we think about prayer, we're kind of like, oh, that kind of sounds boring. We can make anything boring, but we tend to think of as prayer as something that we don't really want to do, but we kind of put it off. Prayer has become more of a last resort. If we can't do something, if we can't, um, help a situation, if we can't be where, you know, comforting someone or bringing them meals, or if there's a situation that arises and we can't be helpful, well, I'll, I'll just pray about it. We kind of say, if I can't do anything, then I will pray. Whereas what we should really be doing is flipping that, let me pray for you, let me pray for this situation, and then I'll step in and I'll be the hands and feet of Jesus. But the first thing that I should be doing is looking at prayer. And, and praying and praying with them and praying over them and praying for them. And we need to kind of retrain our brains, if you want to think of it that way, to think of prayer first and everything else come next. So as we journey these next few weeks, we're going to be looking at passages about prayer. Um, we're going to be looking mostly at prayer in Scripture, the prayers that have been prayed by those who came before us to see what they did and how they did it and what they said. And I think sometimes we get so stuck because we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We don't understand. So we're just going to spend this time really hammering that out so that we can be on the same page and we can be people of prayer. To do that today, I really want to dig into... Um, a passage found in the book of Mark. I can't tell you, I don't think this is a passage I've ever preached on before. And it was an interesting choice as we were planning out our series and, and Matt and I were sitting down just talking about, you know, okay, well, what passages does, you know, should we go to and how should we preach? And we landed on Mark chapter 9. Now, what happens at the beginning of this chapter is really cool. So this is when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up this mountain. And while they're on this mountain, Jesus 
We call it his transfiguration. That's a $10 word. Jesus basically shows his glory to those three disciples. He becomes like he would be when he's in heaven. When you read the words in the Bible, they say his clothes became white, whiter than any bleach could possibly make them. And, and it's just this glorious scene. And, and as Jesus is standing there in his glory, Elijah and Moses come on the scene and they start talking. And those are like rock stars if you were a Jew. I mean, Elijah and Moses are people you knew everything about. And they're just, the disciples are there seeing this happen. And then God says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And then Jesus just goes back to being normal old Jesus, what they're used to seeing, the, the human side of Jesus. They've just gotten a taste of what heaven will be like. They've just seen the glory. They've just heard God speak about him. And they just have this amazing moment on this mountaintop. And it is so cool. And then they come down the mountain, and everything is in chaos. This glorious moment passes, and they enter into a giant argument. The contrast is this glorious moment, and then, really, as soon as they come down the mountain. I'm going to start reading in chapter, or in chapter 9, but I'm going to start at verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them with the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Prayer is about dependence on God. These, these last two verses that I read show us a lot about what's going on. It says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. See, I've always been a little bit confused about what happened here. And, and, and the disciples are confused. Scripture says that Jesus had given them the authority to cast out demons, that they, this is something that they should be able to do. And, and this scene plays out where there's the arguing, and then Jesus comes on the scene, and, and he finds out what's going on. And then as he's talking to the father about his son, this crowd, this crowd starts kind of, it seems like they're almost running towards them, like they're going to overtake them, and Jesus casts out the spirit, and then they go inside. They go away from the crowd. They go indoors, and the disciples look at Jesus, and they say, well, why couldn't we do that? You see, they're preoccupied with not that Jesus did this amazing miracle and how cool, but why couldn't we do that? The disciples want to know what happened to their power, to their authority. Why couldn't they be the ones who stepped in and healed this boy? 
And I looked in several different commentaries, and I'm trying to figure this out, and, and people much, much smarter than myself, they say the disciples are looking to them themselves. They wanted to be the ones to heal this person. They, I mean, come on, if you were given the authority to cast out impure spirits and, and eventually they'll be able to heal people, wouldn't that be really exciting? And wouldn't you want to do that? You'd be like, look what I can do. And you could do all these cool things. The disciples are like, okay, we got this. We can do this. But when they ask Jesus, why couldn't we do this? He says, Guys, this, this can only come out by prayer. This can come out by you seeking after me, by you asking God, by you depending on God to move. It is God who works through you. It is not you who does anything. But it is God who gives you the power and the authority to do this, and it is him, and you should be praying, and you should be seeking God, for God to move. The disciples are preoccupied with, why couldn't we do this? Sometimes I think we get a little preoccupied with ourselves too. We like to be the people who rush in and we're the ones who are able to bring help in a tough situation. We like it when we can bring healing or we can bring relief or we can bring help to people. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, but we first have to make sure that we are the ones depending on God. See, we need to go to God first and say, God, what would you have me do? How can I be you in this situation to these people? How can I step in and be your hands and your feet? There's nothing wrong with wanting to do things. The disciples were trying to do something good. They were trying to heal someone who needed healing. They were trying to do what they had seen Jesus do time and time again. But they got preoccupied with themselves. Jesus says, you need to pray. You need to depend on God. One of my very favorite authors is Mark Batterson. If you have ever gone in my office and seen all of those shelves of books, you will notice a significant portion are written by him. I think he's very practical, and he writes a lot about prayer, and he writes a lot about um, how we need to depend on God. But one of my very favorite, like, all-time quotes from him is that we need to work like it depends on us, but we need to pray like it depends on God. What he's saying is, yes, we should be doing things. We should be active. We should be actively reaching into people's lives. We should be actively seeking after the lost. We should be working for the kingdom of God and using our gifts. But we have to pray like it depends on God because it does. Everything that we do, anything that we want to do in the kingdom of God, anything that we are seeking to do depends on God. We need him to work in us and work through us. If we want to see the change in our community, yeah, we can be good citizens and we can love people, but if we're not doing it out of dependence on God, who can do more than we could ask or imagine, then we're missing it. He says, yes, work hard, do things, work hard for the kingdom of God, work so hard like, it, like you think the kingdom is depending on you, but know in your brain that it's really not. That's just the level of hard work that sometimes it takes. But it means nothing if we're not praying like it depends on God, because that is where true change will happen. That is where we will see God move like we've not seen him move before. When we pray like it depends on God, because it does. If we want to be the church that we all have the dream of becoming, where we are a center, a hospital for the sick, where we are seeing people come to salvation, where we are seeing people even go out and minister in the community and maybe send people overseas, whatever the case may be. It has to start with us realizing our full dependence upon God and not ourselves. We can do some really good stuff, but God can do some really great things. So realizing that what we do is an outflow of who he is, that is, what, that is what, help, what prayer helps us to do. When we go to God and pray for him to move, we're recognizing, God, I can't do this, but you can. 
No, I know, I know the topic of prayer is tough because I know some of you are thinking, I don't have time to pray like it depends on God. I know it depends on God. I know these things, but I don't have time. I've got kids in school. I've got a job. Maybe, maybe I'm in school. This is my life. I'm talking for myself. Um, I go back to school tomorrow with my children. My degree that I'm working on starts August 20th. I work here. We do all kinds of stuff. Sometimes I feel like I don't have time, and I'm tempted to make the excuse, I don't have time, but I know that's not the case because God has very clearly told me that is not the case. And I can tell you, we do have time. To pray like it depends on God doesn't mean that we have to go John Wesley style and pray for three hours every day because I don't have that time and neither do you. I can tell you that one. But I do have time while I'm driving to work. I got about 20 minutes by myself. Might be the only alone time I get all day. I can get up a few minutes early. It usually requires me to preset the coffee maker so that I have my coffee so I can concentrate. I can pray as I'm walking down the hallway or I've taught my children to pray when they hear the sirens of the ambulance or the fire department. Even if we see a cop going down the road, we pray for the person. <laughs> Because they need our prayers. Because they're out there on the front lines. Because someone might be hurt. Doesn't mean that we have to sit there for an hour and pray, but it says, God, please help this situation. Whatever is going on, may you be there. May you protect everybody involved. And we pray over them. It's, it's working prayer into our natural rhythm. I know many of us pray before meals. I know that that's something that we're pretty good at. I know I was taught as a child to pray right before I go to sleep. And, and does anyone here know the now I lay me down to sleep prayer? As I've gotten older, that prayer kind of <laughs> scares me a bit. But as a child, that's what we did. And that's just what we were taught, and that was good enough. But as I've grown in my faith, I realize that if we're just praying for a minute or so at bedtime, and we're praying for maybe 20 seconds before a meal, I might be praying for five minutes or less each day. Is that me praying like it depends on God? Or is that me praying so that I can say that I prayed? This is the struggle that I have. You see, we're called to be people of prayer. Scripture talks about praying without ceasing. It talks about that we are just walking with God when, when we're doing what we normally do. And I know that you have to focus on the things that you're doing, but sometimes I find myself when I'm just frustrated and I'm having a hard day or uh, my child is having a hard day and I'm trying to help them, sometimes the only prayer I can get out is just Jesus. And that's okay. That's a prayer. When you're calling on his name to refocus you and to recenter you and to remind you that it is him you are seeking after and seeking to glorify, and you want him to move in the situation, he understands. I'm not saying we have to set aside hours each day because that's just not the reality. If you're called to that, sure, do it. But most of us have time where we can incorporate prayer into what we're naturally doing, into the flow of our day. Maybe we can set aside five minutes or ten minutes and we can make that a time where we're just seeking after God. It's us showing that we are dependent on him because out of this time that we set aside and we spend with him, that is how he changes us and that is how he changes the world around us. So that's, I'm going to issue the challenge this week. Think of times that you already have that you can be praying Maybe it's riding the lawnmower. Maybe, okay, this is mine. Maybe it's washing the dishes because you really hate washing the dishes. But you're like, God, thank you for these dishes that you've given me. Thank you for the children who ate off them. Whatever it is, we can thank God for what we have. And we can pray over others and the situations in our life. In our world, guys, we need prayer. I think we just saw from from another church leader around the world that what the Taliban is now targeting Christian churches, Christian house churches. 
and they've been given notes that we're coming for you. We can pray for them. We need to pray for them. We have time. We need to use it. I think one of the most honest conversations in Scripture happens between Jesus and this Father. When Jesus is trying to understand what's going on, when he's, he's come down and, and the disciples said, or the father says, well, they, they couldn't heal him. And Jesus says, well, what's going on? And so he kind of gets the scoop. He says, well, how long has, has it been like this? In verse 21, and, and the father says, from childhood. It's often thrown him into the fire and the water to kill him. But, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Do you hear that? He's talking to Jesus. If you can do something, if you, if you can do anything, will you have pity on us? This is the second thing I want to point out to you is, is that he can. See, this father is frustrated. He's brought his son. We don't know how old the son is because when he asks how long this has been happening, he says, well, since childhood. Is this a teenager? Is this a grown man? We don't know how old this boy is, but his father has brought him to be healed because the message of, of Jesus and the disciples is getting out there, but, but the message, um, people are sharing the healings and the amazing miracles that are happening, that's getting around so fast that people are just coming in droves to see Jesus. And this father brings his son, whether he lives near or whether he traveled miles, we have no idea, but he gets his son to Jesus and, and he encounters the disciples and he says, okay, guys, can you do this miraculous thing? Because I know that you've been doing it all over and the disciples can't. The disciples, they can't heal the boy. And, and when Jesus comes down the mountain, he says, what's going on? And, and they say, your disciples couldn't heal my boy. Can you, if, I mean, I mean if, if you can do anything, if you can. And Jesus says, if you can, if you can, Everything is possible for one who believes. Could you imagine coming up to Jesus and saying, well, if, if you can do something, could you step in? But I think that's sometimes how we pray, isn't it? God, if, if you can fix this situation, if you could heal this person, if you can. But... I think we need to remember that, yeah, he can. It's not a question of if you can. You see, we believe that our God created everything. We believe that he holds the universe together, that he put the world in order, that he created each one of us. We believe that our God can do absolutely anything. We believe that our God can do anything. Our scriptures tell us this again and again. And, and we know that God moves in mighty ways, but sometimes when it comes to prayer, we're not really sure. But I think what we need to remember is that, yes, he can. Now, I'm going to put out a little, uh, like an asterisk here, like a note. Just because he can does not mean that he always will. This is not a um, health and wealth, name it, claim it. I'm not saying if you, if you pray for a million dollars and you believe enough you're going to get it. That's not the case. Please don't hear that. What I'm saying is when we go before God and when we're praying, we need to remember who our God is and what he can do. And that is absolutely anything. We see miracle after miracle after miracle in Scripture. Here he heals this boy. We couldn't even do that with modern medicine, depending on what was going on, and certainly not if, you know, here when he's casting out an impure spirit. But Jesus can. We need to remember that our God can, that nothing is impossible with him. The trouble here is that um, it's very specific to North America, too, and, and, and even parts in, in Europe where we have this, what we call the Western mindset, is we don't leave room so much for miracles. 
We don't really understand and we don't really know how it all happens. And we like to know how things happen. We like to know, uh, break it down into scientific format. And we like numbers and we like statistics. And we like to know what happened and when it happened and how it happened and who did it. We're really preoccupied with that. But whenever we travel, specifically whenever I spend time in Africa, that's one of the things I love about their culture is they don't really care about that stuff. They just know that God can move. They know that God can do phenomenal things. I mean, there are stories literally of God raising the dead there. Somebody passes away, but then a Christian comes in and they pray over this person. And there are so many stories from our own missionaries of them getting back up and being believers in Jesus. There are stories of miraculous healings, of exactly what happens here, of the unclean spirits being cast out because Jesus still moves, because Jesus still does these things, because he can do these things. When we are praying, it's really important for us to remember that, yes, he can. When I was in Africa in 2019, I remember... Um, the one day that I was supposed to teach in the morning, like teach a seminar to the pastor's conference that was happening, um, which was super intimidating because this whole room is full of pastors and church workers and people who have been in ministry longer than I have been alive. And here I am teaching a seminar to them, but I'm also supposed to preach to them that night. And I don't feel good at all. I don't feel well. And my, my, morning ends up, it goes really quick, and um, I end up doing a shorter message. And then before I leave, one of the pastors from our team says, hey, you know, she's not feeling very well. Let's pray over her. And you know what? That whole room came up and around me, and they prayed, and they're like, God, we know you can do this. And I remember there was one lady, I was not expecting this, she came over and she started touching different parts of my body and praying like over my head and over my chest and over my tummy. And she was just like touching me and praying over because she's like, oh yeah, God got this. And she's just praying. And that whole room just came up and they were like, oh yeah, God's got this. And they prayed. And I did preach that night. And I did, I had a migraine. And when I went to preach, gone. And God just, it was small. He showed me what he could do. It was so small, just making me feel better so that I could do what was there. But it's one of those, yeah, I got this. Of course, I, I can do this. And did he have to? No. Could God have said no? Absolutely. It's a different sermon for a different day, but sometimes we need to understand that God's answers are no. Just as we tell our children no, because we know what's better for them. We know what they need and we know what they don't need. Sometimes God says no. It's not a lack of faith. It's not us saying the right words. It's not us getting something wrong. Whenever we pray for whatever it is, for however we want God to move, we need to have it in the forefront of our mind that, yeah, he can. He can do whatever it is we're asking him to do. He has the power. He knows how to do it. There's nothing that our God cannot do. So this father came up, and he's talking to Jesus, and he says, well, if you can do something. Jesus says, if you can. If you've got faith, anything is possible. I love that about our God. Anything is possible with our God. When we believe that he is who he says he is, when we believe that he is ready to move, when we believe that he loves people more than we ever could, when we believe that he wants them in relationship, when we believe that he is the God of this universe, nothing's impossible. So whenever we pray, remember that he can. And the last thing I want to point out in this passage is that, guys, we got to be united. We need to be united. When Jesus came down that mountain, he walked into essentially a battle zone between the disciples and between the Pharisees and the religious leaders. 
The father brings his boy to be healed. Okay, we already established that. I've said it like five times. We know what's going on. But what happens is the disciples can't do it. They try. Maybe they're like, okay, you know, leave this person in the name of Jesus. However they're doing it, whatever they're doing. It's not working. But then you have the religious leaders and the Pharisees, and and what they're trying to do is, is, you know, get this ministry out of the way. They don't like it. They don't like what they're doing because the Jewish culture, they had their own people to do this kind of thing. And you have this big argument taking place, and they're starting to throw, um, you know, their anger at each other. And they're basically... They're just arguing between themselves, and this poor father and boy are just sitting there along the side like, what about us? We came here for help. We brought us to you. We came to you. I brought my son to you because I thought you could help, because I thought that you could heal him, because I thought that this is what we should do. But they're kind of to the side as the people are arguing about what's going on. What would have happened if instead of arguing with each other, instead of trying to one-up each other, instead of trying to be right, instead of trying to win the argument, whatever the case may be, if they had been able to say, well, we believe in God, and we believe in God, and we believe God can heal this person, what if we, even though they're Pharisees, and they, they worship God in a way that's different than you know, what Jesus is doing, what would have happened if they would have said, well, let's just pray for him, instead of let's fight each other to see who's right? Are we more preoccupied with who's right? Are we more occupied to win the argument, to get the last word, to show that our side is better than the other side? than to come together on the things that unite us. I think our church in North America is in trouble because we are too many times the disciples and the Pharisees. While the people who are coming to us for healing and for help, they're just kind of to the side watching us fight each other. I know that talking about unity is hard because there are so many different beliefs. There are so many different thoughts on the right way to worship God. And, well, I'm the Wesleyan denomination. I'm the Baptist denomination. I'm in a home church over here. I'm non-denominational. And we kind of, we, we seclude ourselves because we do things one way and they do things another. But prayer should be the thing that unites us. Because we all believe that God is God. That Jesus is the Son of God. And that it is more important for us to share the word of God and to bring people into the kingdom than to spend time arguing with one another over whatever it is we're arguing about. I've spent a lot of time praying with people of of different Religious backgrounds, Um, it's one of the things I've loved the most about working in a school. Uh, We had a prayer group when I was in Pennsylvania, and it was my favorite day of the week. And I prayed. I was the only one there, I think, who wasn't Catholic. But you know what? We prayed together. I know our Father. We could pray together. I may not have crossed myself when they did, but that's okay. They do it different than I do, but we could pray together. Because when we unite together in prayer, we put God's mission first. It's not my mission. It's not anything else. It is the mission of God. I'm not saying that we have to allow anything and everything. That we have to, um, you know, ask no questions and, and never have an opinion or never speak our mind. But I'm saying we need to let the things that unite us like prayer be louder than the things that divide us. It was when Jesus came on the scene that he was able 
to help this man. When they got a clear view of Jesus, when they were able to encounter Jesus, that this man's life and his boy's life was changed completely. It's when people in our world get a clear view of Jesus, that they get a clear view of him, that they encounter him, that their lives are changed. But if all we're doing is arguing with one another, especially, I mean, I think social media is the easiest place to point right now. If we're just fighting with people and we're just sharing things that divide instead of unite, is that really helping the mission of God? We need to be united together and nothing unites us together quite like praying with one another and especially praying for one another. Before Jesus went to the cross, we have this just beautiful prayer that he prayed. And my favorite part of his prayer is when he prays for those who would come later, for us. He's praying for us, that we would be united, that we would stand together, that we as his people would be one. And the great way for us to do that, guys, is to be praying with our other believers. Whether you come here on Tuesdays and you pray at 2 o'clock, that's amazing. Come and join your tribe in your own church and pray. But go to the prayer meetings at work. Pray with people you don't even know necessarily what church they go to because you worship the same God. Pray for people. Nothing will unite us together quicker than when we are able to come together and pray together. I know that we've covered a decent amount of stuff this morning, that prayer is not an easy topic to discuss because there is so much going on, and sometimes it is hard for us to slow down, to make the time, but if we don't start making the time for prayer now, then we're going to miss what God could be doing. We're going to miss it. When we pray, it's a reminder that we are dependent upon God, that it is God who is working in us, that it is God who is working through us, that it is through him that we live and move and have our being. It's not anything that we do, but it's him working in us and through us. And we can see how he is moving. Set aside that time. I think if you can even set aside five minutes, ten minutes, it will have an impact not only on you, but on the world around you. And what I have found from my own prayer journey is that the more time I spend with God, the more time I want to spend with God. The more that he can do. We need to remember that he can. There's no prayer request that we're going to bring to God that is too big for him to tackle, where it's out of the realm of his possibility. Because, because he can. There is nothing that he cannot do. When we have the faith to know that our God can do absolutely anything, our prayers, they just become, um, sometimes I'd say crazy, sometimes they become big, and our vision finally starts to get big like the vision God has. When we understand that there's nothing that he's incapable of. And we need, to, we need to be praying with those around us. We need to be praying for those around us because this is how we can really build unity. And that's what we need. We need unity in the body. We need to be united here in our own church, but we need to be united with other believers because we're for the same purpose. We want God's kingdom to come. We want his will to be done. We want people to be saved. We need to be praying together 
for this mission. We need to be more focused on who our God is and what he can do and on his plan than on anything else. Let our voices ring out with the prayers and with just the praise of what our God is doing. So find that time. Find that time on your own schedule. Find that time, those quiet moments where you can pray. When life is overwhelming, remember that even if all you can do is say the name Jesus, he hears you. He hears your heart and he's there. Look for opportunities to pray with those around you. You would be amazed at how many people would love to pray with someone or have someone pray for them or with them in that moment. Be united together, not only here, but wherever we go with other believers. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that we can pray, that you hear our prayers. Lord, I thank you that you let us, the creation, the those of us who are just don't measure up. We're so far from perfect, Father. You love us anyway. You let us come before you and to bring our cares, the, the things that are so important and the things, Lord, that are really not. You want to hear it all and you want to know and you want to know all about our days and you want to hear us. Father, I pray that we would just make the time to spend with you, that we would make the time to spend time in prayer, that you would show us when we're saying, I don't have time for this, you would show us where we do have the time. You would help us. You would remind us. You would draw us in. Father, I pray that as we start out these next few weeks, that you would just really teach us. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to be so dependent upon you that we couldn't imagine going through a day without praying. Father, remind us of who you are and your plans for this world. Lord, may we be people who just become more and more like you. Father, may you make us into praying people and a praying church where we are truly fulfilling this praying without ceasing that you speak of in scripture. Father, I pray that as we sing this song and we go from here, Lord, I pray that you would just work in us and stir us and give us the urgency and the passion to be praying over our family and our friends and our co-workers and our world, Father, because we need it. Lord, unite us together so that we may become who you've called us to be. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we stand, let's just, you know, think about how encouraging this, this series is going to be about prayer and that no matter what we face, God has a world of opportunity and possibilities, and if it is in his will, he will be by your side, and he'll work it out in a way we can't even imagine. As we start to sing the song, we introduced it last week. Yes, he can. As we go into singing this song, let's stand and let's just think about prayers that he's answered in our lives and look forward to everything that he has for us. Let's have fun.